actually, we do have, we'll move on uh, briefly from you. I'd like to also maybe hear from uh, Vice Admiral Pradeep about uh, the Indian role uh, with Myanmar as well. But um, first, there is a question from David Kamru. Uh, he's asked uh, on Myanmar, and then we'll move very quickly, perhaps uh, uh, to Vice Admiral Pradeep, and then uh, on to other questions uh, and other topics. Um, David, you put, had your ha metaphorical hand up. Hello, David, you're on mute. I have to be also. Sorry, would, would you say again? What was the question? No. Okay, um, I cannot hear you. I've got it now, yeah, I've got it. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, on, on ASEAN, there's a lot, when we talk in about Europe, we talk about the problem of the expectations capability gap. The expectations that a regional association can do something and its capacity to do something. Uh, is that the case for, for, for ASEAN? Because I get the impression that for ASEAN, the forest covers the trees. We don't see the trees, we see the forest. In, in that light, should we not be relying more on individual ASEAN members like uh, Indonesia rather than the associations as a whole? Because the association as a whole, let's be, let's be brutally honest, doesn't have the systemic capacity, nor is there the political will to really resolve the uh, Myanmar crisis. And so, for, so what they've done so far is to buy time for the regime and to give legitimacy uh, to the junta. So uh, that's like specifically about uh, ASEAN vis-a-vis -vis Myanmar, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, Minzin, would you like first to tackle that and any other panelists, if you have a view on that? And very briefly, uh, of course, we can point out flowers. I mean, I mean ASEAN as, as it is, itself is a very much, you know, kind of facilitators rather than, you know, like um, 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 uh, the way that you see in the other, um, the, the regional institution, ASEAN is more, more like convener, right, uh, of the consensus. So it's a very slow and very, uh, very um, uh, difficult position. But when it comes to Myanmar, at least ASEAN come to consensus on the five point consensus, which is quite acceptable and which is uh, quite um, uh, important consensus. So to me, um, individual ASEAN country, if they I mean, deviate from the ASEAN consensus and do their own initiative, that would be difficult for other regional powers such as India, China, uh, 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 and Japan to, uh, to, to work with that individual countries. Uh, you know, because the United Nations Security Council give mandate to ASEAN as a, as a role to play when it comes to Myanmar. So I, I think like uh, somehow one reason why ASEAN is getting this prominent is the major power in the region do not want to give each other credit. That's why they give ASEAN credit to play a role. So I think we should take advantage of this situation and this reality. Uh, I think so with all these, uh, all these uh, constraints, but ASEAN can play at, at least right now, the humanitarian intervention role. I think that, that can bring other player together too. Right, uh, Kawi, you've got your hand up and and then uh, Pradeep, Kawi. You're on mute, mute. No, we can't hear you, cannot hear you. Uh, okay, you can... okay, okay, All right. yes, okay. I agree with Minson's analysis that ASEAN led humanitarian must start now. But ASEAN in it itself has its uh, limitation and constraint by budget and personnel. For example, AHA Center. AHA Center can, can facilitate, but you need uh, help from dialogue partner and international community. In your earlier reference, you mentioned to psychonarchists, there is a kind of difference between a system for psychonarchists and what gonna happen next uh, in Myanmar. The psychonarchists, because of Dr. Serene, was able to convince Myanmar to have uh, the kind of uh, collision led. Myanmar follow, but this time, as you can see, Myanmar has a, 
uh, kind of leverage in the sense that whatever you, you, you discuss, whatever you propose, for example, the ASEAN uh, Special and War, you need uh, uh, Myanmar uh, regimes to say, okay. So the point David said that, uh, can individual ASEAN country, Indonesia, go its own way? No. Indonesia can act tough, Singapore can act tough, can speak tough, but uh, in actual uh, action, they cannot do that because it would ruin ASEAN. ASEAN act as a team is slow. ASEAN uh, move very slowly, but surely, because ASEAN commitment is not uh, for a short term, it's for a sustainable uh, a solution. That, that I would uh, argue. So I don't think uh, the kind of uh, a suggestion that uh, ASEAN will form a coalition of willing, no. ASEAN mm -hmm. as a group, it's a group of coalition of healing already in that sense. Thank right. you. I think also really, uh, we, we've got to be realistic about ASEAN's very strict rule of consensus and centrality. Myanmar is a member of the same organization that has a rule of centrality. It only has to be yeah. told one thing, as we know, as you said, they can't even appoint an envoy. They cannot agree on an envoy because of this kind of consensus. But anyway, that's the point. I think, Pradeep, you had one, and then Claire uh, has that's a very good question that's going to, I think, draw the net wider and, and put it back on the Indo-Pacific and our original question, which was, can the Indo-Pacific region as a framework or as a, as you said, uh, Pradeep, uh, an idea, <laughs> uh, really um, uh, offer any solutions? But anyway. No, I thank you very much, uh, Ren. I just wanted to uh, make a couple of points on Myanmar first, since that's what we began with, and then if you permit and time permits, I'll try and widen this up a bit. Uh, you know, the, 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 there, is, there are two overarches we must understand. One is, if you proceed as a human being, then you go to one place. That means you, you proceed, your argument takes you to one place. If you start as a nation state, then you don't always land up in the same place and you start land up in a different place. So you have to take a view on this and decide which one you are arguing for. Second, I think it's incredibly naive to believe that uh, you can actually frame any country, uh, including Myanmar, uh, in an area you know, outside of the geopolitical jockeying that goes on. It is possible to do so with involving, let's say, China or let's say uh, the United States, well, it is a country, a nation state. Assuming that you have not begun from people, but you have begun from the nation state. And if you have begun from people, then this is the wrong forum in which to discuss any of all this. But if you've begun from the nation state, this is not possible. China and Russia are as close to a uh, strategic alliance as you can possibly get without a formal structure. So it is incredible to, for me at least, to hear that Russia is behind this, but not China. Uh, I, I find it, I find it, um, I don't know, I'm trying to find some polite word. I think, I think naive is probably right. Um, let me continue with uh, India and uh, Gwen asked about India and what its uh, views are on this. Yes, so, I think uh, also Pradeep, you're cutting in and out a bit. Uh, I'm not sure if something's got, your sound was fine before. So maybe you need to speak a bit closer to the microphone or something. All right, I'll do that. Uh, yes, uh, that's is better. that any better? Oh, yes. Okay, so I said what I had said earlier or was it all in static? No, we could hear, we could hear. Okay, so no need to go back there again. Uh, there'll be many people who will be relieved to hear that. Uh, but I want to emphasize that where India is concerned, don't forget that India has a 1,643 kilometer border with Myanmar. Hmm. And that border impacts us. So what happens in the coup is that a large number of, say, uh, in ethnic uh, peoples, uh, they have direct ethnic linkages with the uh, northeastern states of India, like Myanmar, like Mizoram, Manipur, or Nagaland. And therefore, India looks at this coup and the impact upon the peoples of that region with a great deal of concern. But 
But we also have to balance this against the larger pressure. Do not forget that we are one of the few countries along with Vietnam that is actually standing up and fighting with the Chinese in physical terms. So we do not have this luxury that the West has or European Union has of pontificating from a distance. I'm sorry, there are actual realities that need to be addressed. And hence, we are on a tightrope walk. So like any tightrope walker, our balancing pole, it, it tends to uh, waver from side to side. Do we think therefore that, uh, that, that, that the, let's take, let's take the refugee issue. You know, the, if you take refugees, uh, of the Rohingya refugees, well before the coup, uh, you can see that while Bangladesh absorbed or has 1.4 million, I think, uh, and, and Malaysia has some 200,000. These are both Islamic countries. India is a non-Islamic country. It is secular. Yet we have 550,000 Rohingyas in India without signing any of the UN uh, protocols on uh, refugees. Therefore, the concern that India has about the coup is direct and, and acute because it impacts India's internal security. On the other hand, if we end up with no influence in Myanmar, we will end up opening Myanmar to strategic competition from, from China. And we don't think that's a good idea for us. We are battling the Chinese, as I've said. So the next point is, that is democracy actually under attack? Of course it is, but democracy is under attack in so many locations. So is it wise for us to concentrate upon, as I said, if we concentrate upon the humanitarian human angles, we will go to one place with one set of activities that we undertake to resolve. And if we start from a nation state, we'll go down geopolitics because that's what nation state interaction means. So I'll, I'll, I'll go now to the Indo-Pacific, if you give me one minute and see, my argument is that the ASEAN centric uh, structures, you know, it is it is very popular in many parts of the world, and since many Indians simply ape what they see in the West, and then you know regurgitate that, it's very popular to say that there are no security structures in the Indian Ocean, in the Indo-Pacific, and so on and so forth. I have shown you that there are. Does ASEAN retain points of centrality in all of them? Of course, I just showed it to you at the executive level, at the conceptual level at the political level. So I think that the larger Indo-Pacific region needs ASEAN to retain A, centrality, but B, pragmatism as to where that central node of ASEAN should fit. And I think that it fits rather well. Right, thank that. you. That's a very good point. Um, I, sorry, uh, Arbinda, we'll, we'll just go to Minzin, Claire, has had a question for some time. Um, Minzin, you spoke about uh, ASEAN's relevance or not on the Myanmar crisis. Um, Ma'am, can I say uh, something, please? What about the larger Indo-Pacific framework and any capacity to propose a humanitarian action? Ma'am, can I say something on Myanmar issue? Uh, sorry, but there is a question here that I was in the middle of asking Minzin, so you can question. No, I just wanted to ask something to Mr. Uh, Amir Chohan's uh, um, take on this issue. Uh, anyway, it's up to you. Well, can can we just do this question, please? I just asked it. Um, no, it's not a question. I just want to say something about uh, Myanmar issue. Okay, one, uh, two minutes. What is it? Two minutes. I can't hear you, ma'am. Can't hear you. I said, if you want, you can speak for two minutes. Yes, two minutes is okay. I just want to say that I uh, I believe uh, whatever I have done on Myanmar is not much, but I believe that the the entire conversation about Myanmar now is based on um, very severe hypocrisy which uh, um, um, uh, Admiral has alluded to, Western countries have the different ways of looking at it. And then they don't look at the, uh, I just will give you one example and stop it. I was speaking in 
Thailand on this issue, Myanmar issue. I have done a project on my Myanmar. Oh. People say that uh, this the United Nations Human Rights Commission, sorry, the Commission on uh, Refugees, High Commission on Refugees. According to them, there were at that time only 28,000 refugees in Bangladesh. Whereas according to my own estimate, it was 350,000. No. How long can you believe, live with these hypocrisies? Myanmar is not about democracy alone. It's all about also um, refugees. I'm not sure how people are dealing with this, uh, these people who are for ageless, uh, uh, being called um, stateless. Why should they be stateless? Who is talking about that? Oh, Last hmm. two days, I have seen this. Nobody is talking about Rohingyas about being stateless. Who is talking about this? Why can't they have a state? We are always talking about Russian centrality and all these things, but then nobody is caring about it. Anyway, that's okay. my take. Thank you. Uh, I think the Rohingya issue is an extremely important one uh, in a uh, separate discussion, perhaps, on the Indo Pacific uh, uh, possibilities for the Indo Pacific framework, uh, which was the question, Min Zin, that uh, Claire had uh, posed. Do you think there's any capacity in that Indo-Pacific framework, whichever ones we're talking about, the American, the Japanese, the broader one, uh, the proposed humanitarian actions or be cohesive in any way for action on Myanmar? My, my guess is it's just too broad, we can't tell. Uh... Briefly speaking, I think that the, the Indo-Pacific is, is really uh, or largely uh, the security and strategic construction. Uh, but in order to make that large entity to sustainable and to be more attractive, you need the identity uh, component to what kind of like norms and values you know you have to construct uh, along with this Indo-Pacific imagination uh, without having the, you know like the values, uh, democratic values, and you know uh, the, the the norms. And human rights norms, so people can easily dismiss human rights as irrelevant or democracy is irrelevant. And then in this case, you will be the same as Chinese in terms of your uh, attractiveness. So I think like um, it's so important to uh, pay attention to the identity uh, dimension of the 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 the, the, uh, the, 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 the entity. Otherwise, if you focus solely on the security and strategic, of course you can say, oh, you guys are talking about human rights and humanitarian, like very naive. But when you're in the place who got killed, like your own seven years old daughters got killed by the military for no reason, you would not say this is, this is, uh, this is like uh, rosy or you know, naive because I think it's so important to, to incorporate like two elements together. Like of course, strategy, economy, security, but at the same time, identity is very important uh, components in politics, you know, uh, identity component is what is lacking in the Indo-Pacific imagination. Right. So are you broadly saying that you you don't feel the Indo-Pacific as a framework, a concept, uh, whatever is is viable as a for the time being, yeah. That's why ASEAN can play a critical role because they had experience. Of course, there's a lot of new yeah. ideas. ASEAN can play and bring the Indo-Pacific and other players together to address this uh, this this issue uh, strategically and also humanitarianly. Thank you. Uh, we're almost out of time and there were two questions asked very early on which um, have been uh, neglected up to now because we moved on to Myanmar. I'd, I'd just like to come back to them also because one of these is addressed uh, specifically mm. to Eric uh, uh, from Dr. Rina Mawal. He asks, if you could elaborate on China's grey zone operations in the South China Sea and how it will continue to impact maritime security, if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, maybe uh, very briefly, just to follow up what uh, has just been said, um, talking about ASEAN, maybe just to keep in mind also the impact of the chairman, uh, depending on the, which country is chairing the association, more or less, precisely personal or think tank capability or what 
to, to, to have a proper influence. Uh, just to make it clear, I didn't say that there is no more uh, maritime security issue in, in the region, um, uh, but just to zoom out from South China Sea to maybe some other uh, areas. But I mean, for me, uh, the sea and uh, maritime security is still a, a key issue. And uh, uh, precisely to, to follow up also this presentation, thank you very much on the Mekong. My colleague, whom I was asking about this issue, told me maybe it's better to, to get a broader perspective and to include also not only Mekong, but also what happened along the Irrawaddy, also the Sarwin River, so all the basin to, together. So, but now uh, moving to the question. Uh, so the gray zone operation, uh, so what is it just when precisely China uh, acts or maneuver between a peace and war? It's not exactly peace, but it's not war uh, uh, yet. Why? Because precisely this is uh, 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 the best way to send signs, messages, signals to the other, to the region, without any risk of uh, escalation of uh, violence and uh, how to proceed. Previously, China was very smart because they were coming with uh, militia, fishermen, white hulls, coast guard, and then after Southeast Asian countries were um, uh, reacting with uh, gray hulls and meaning the navies. And then China was saying, see, see, you have those uh, sending the navy, so uh, then to make it the situation more dangerous. But now uh, I think it's a, uh, it's a, uh, a friend of mine talked to me about the coast guardization in Southeast Asia because more and more coast guard uh, and they have a bigger role now in maritime security. Right. And then more so for China uh, using all these research vessels, these drones, uh, so many ways to precisely maneuver between peace and, uh, and war. And just question, uh, question because if you are in between, so what about the next step? moving to the something more peaceful, I don't know, uh, status quo, maybe, because this is a key word across uh, interviews, always talking about the status quo, uh, eventually, and maybe more concerning, maybe moving back to something uh, closer to war, and just to keep in mind that gray hulls are back, aircraft carrier, frigates as well, so uh, plus this idea of possible base in the region, so this, I think we have to be a, a bit uh, concerned. Go on. Right, interesting. And uh, the Coast Guardization is actually, it's a really good topic, uh, almost worth another conference. Um, so thank you. Uh, we really are running out of time. So I wanted to ask this other earlier question and then give the floor briefly to Jean-Pierre, who has not said uh, anything since uh, your very interesting talk. So first of all, uh, a question for um, Professor Pradeep uh, from Chertsak Virapat. Uh, he asks, one way to improve cooperation and collaboration is to improve knowledge and capacity of government officers of countries in ASEAN and the Indian Ocean on a more holistic framework and implementation to build up networks of ambassadors of maritime security and safety for peaceful uses of marine space resources and environment. These legal frameworks are UNCLOS, UN Convention, Law of the Sea, and related instruments. To your knowledge, do you know if anyone is conducting such kind of ocean governance training for the regions? And if you could keep it very short. Yeah, I've already answered uh, this question to him on a one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, uh, right, okay. Right. So I'll, uh, I'll just uh, put in a five second input in that, and it's a plug, I guess. Uh, yes, the answer is yes, and I agree with him in entirety because two incompetences cannot produce a competence, and therefore the need for actually developing competence across the region is acute. Uh, within India, the National Maritime Foundation plays exactly this kind of role. We do uh, conduct uh, uh, sessions uh, for not only Indian diplomats, but diplomats of the region, and I think that uh, he has in turn guided me on to the, uh, to the um, International Oceans Institute. And so there are, there are institutions that are building this thing. Thank right, you. thank you. And Jean-Pierre, you um, wanted to say something. Thank you, uh, thank you, Gwen. I, I'm gonna be very brief, but I wanted to make a few points regarding the, first of all, this Indo-Pacific 
uh, concept. I think uh, what is I interesting is most countries of the region have accepted the concept of Indo-Pacific, including China, which was at the beginning very reluctant to endorse it uh, because it brings uh, nations like India, you know, more uh, into this into the picture, including the South China Sea, or maybe the Taiwan Strait, another part of the world. The the other thing is uh, regarding the Indo-Pacific uh, concept. Uh, we, and security issue, it's, it's not a concept which is going to solve domestic issues. I mean, we cannot ask uh, the Indo-Pacific to solve the, for instance, the Myanmar crisis or other domestic crisis in, in the region. Now, the, the major objective, uh, I think, of the new landscape is to, to create a new balance of power that I kind of uh, mentioned in my own presentation and, and mitigate tensions and, and preserve peace in the region. Uh, Eric mentioned the gray zone strategy uh, developed by China, which is not without risks and risks of uh, military crisis and, and, and maybe war because uh, it, it's, it's a game which uh, sort of uh, pushes uh, nations, uh, China, but also the US and other players to take more risks. So the big question for the Indo-Pacific concept will be to manage all those crises and, and the risks down the road. Now, um, I will end my, my short, brief, very brief present, uh, comment with, with a question, actually. Of course, there are risks in the South China Sea, and um, uh, maybe uh, the player are not going to be able to, to manage them. But uh, uh, another um, um, a zone where there are even more bigger risks, I, I would argue, is the Taiwan Strait. And the question for the ASEAN and the ASEAN countries is what can, you know, if, you, if, if a military crisis erupts in the Taiwan Strait, how, how the ASEAN is going to react? How is the, you know, Japan made some comments recently that it will uh, be, get involved in, 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 the, in the contingency. Uh, in the Taiwan Strait, what about the ASEAN? I mean, they, that's something I think the ASEAN has to think about, even if it will uh, obviously stay away from any kind of crisis or, 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 or war in the Taiwan Strait. So I will end on that note. Thank oh, you. Thank you very much. I'm glad you sorted your connectivity out. We can hear you much more clearly now. Yeah, it's it's um, better now. On that, uh, it's gone 6.30 and uh, I'd just like to thank uh, the organizers of this uh, incredible two-day conference with so many views and also this uh, this fascinating panel and sorry that you didn't all get uh, get a long um, long uh, period of uh, to say but I think uh, actually we we did have a fascinating variety of views and I'd like to thank you all very much and particularly to Nipley and Claire uh, and the other organizers, uh, Ajahn Sutipat, for, um, for really giving us a great forum the last couple of days. So I'd like to hand over to, uh, I think you, Lip Lee, and thank you to the panelists.